Welcome to the afternoon se speaking sessions. Keith is going to start off our featured speaking sessions with storytelling in sports, entertainment, and nonprofit PR. Keith Green is an accomplished marketing communications pro, dynamic speaker, storyteller, teacher, and mentor, and the founder of Autism MVP, the all volunteer nonprofit dedicated to increasing the number and quality of autism focused educators. From the hardwood of the NBA with the Philadelphia 76ers to the asphalt tra race tracks of NASCAR with the Richmond Raceway to the inspiring stories behind the world's super, sorry, <laughs> superlatives with Gen Genesis World records. Keith Green has more than two decades of sports and entertainment focused IMC experience. So join me in welcoming Keith. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks, everybody. It's great to be here. It's an honor, actually, to be here. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to chatting with you today. I want to make this interactive. If you have questions, um, certainly um, feel free to stop me along the way. That's how I like to do my presentations, and I'm happy to answer questions that you may have. I do want to share a little bit more background um, on my experience, because I actually talked to a couple people last night at the opening reception, and I guess they had read my background, and they say, wow, you have an interesting mix of sports and entertainment and nonprofit, and how exactly did that uh, work for you, and how does that lead, or how did that lead to uh, your storytelling efforts? And I'll share a little bit about it. My first um, full-time job coming out of college was working with the Philadelphia 76ers in their ticket office. I was selling season ticket packages and group packages um, to our customers, and it was a great way to interact with the public, our customers, our buying customers, our prospective customers. And it served many great lessons for me in terms of dealing with different personalities, um, different sort of people from walks of life in terms of um, what they wanted to purchase or what they were looking for um, out of buying a season ticket package. From there, I actually worked in that capacity for two and a half years and was promoted into the team's first ever community relations department. And at the time, the Sixers were actually the very last NBA team to form a community relations department. So it was a very neat experience to be on the ground floor and building a department from scratch where we were figuring out um, some of the best community partners to work with. We formed a, a reading program with the Ronald McDonald House. We did a fundraiser for Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. We put on uh, basketball clinics for kids in the city. And it was just a very fun and different way to get involved with our players and our coaches and our staff um, and really learn more about the community and the environment um, in Philadelphia. Now, I was there for a little bit more than six, for more than six years. And you'll have to bear with me. I'm fighting some horrible allergies. I was there for a little bit more than six years, and there was a looming sort of labor stoppage in the NBA. You guys m might remember from past experiences in other sports, the NFL has labor stoppages. There's a strike. Well, there was one looming in the late 90s, and this was sort of handwriting on the wall for me. They were going to start to lay people off. And I happened to get a call about a job working in racing. I knew nothing about NASCAR racing at all, even though I was a big sports fan growing up. And I ended up um, working um, at, a, at a place called Nazareth Speedway near where I grew up in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And um, absolutely loved that experience. Did that for two and a half years before getting promoted within the company to run um, the PR efforts for Richmond Raceway in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I don't want to say it was my favorite job, but it was really, it's, it's up there just in terms of how much fun it was. Um, I think when they look back on the history of NASCAR and its popularity, the time that was in the sport, um, I think I was very fortunate in that it was extremely popular. The racetrack that I was working at in Richmond held 112,000 seats. We were credentialing 500 people, um, several hundred media on race weekends. And it was just very intense, but very fun. You can see a couple pictures up here from, uh, from my time at the track, uh, press conference with Jeff Gordon there uh, in the middle. And on the right is Gene Simmons, who was telling me a very inappropriate joke, getting ready for a press conference. Um, but we were there promoting the Chevy Rock and Roll 400, where bands would come in and, and play before. Um, <clears throat> play before and after the, uh, the races. Um, I actually knew the day I set foot in Richmond, Virginia, I wanted to move back up north because I'm a, a northeast person at heart. 
and um, exploring opportunities to, conti to continue working for uh, my company, but there was nothing that really made sense geographically. They were gonna build a track on Staten Island, and I was in talks with my company about being the PR director for that track, but that track never came to pass for a lot of different reasons, and it's probably a good thing in retrospect. So I ended up taking a job and staying there for more than eight years at a company called Synergy Events. And when I was there, I actually formed a partnership with my friends from PRSA that are here, by the way, when I was at Synergy. And uh, we were the experiential marketing arm for brands and agencies, where we would bring brands to life through PR stunts like you see here, or product launches, or, wh or what have you. And I got to see a lot of this and have a front row seat to it when I worked in racing and saw all the companies spend millions and millions of dollars um, activating their brands at the races in order to get the attention of, of different fans and, and customers. So here up on the screen are a couple different examples of some of the work that we did when I was at Synergy. Uh, the one on the left is the world's tallest pinata um, for M&Ms and celebrating the uh, chocolate pretzel candy's first birthday. And I'll tell you a story about that later. And on the right, um, here I am on uh, the beach of the Jersey Shore, we did uh, the world's longest ribbon cutting uh, to reopen the Jersey Shore. It was more than five miles long after Hurricane Sandy. It was a very symbolic way to let people know that even though the hurricane had devastated the Jersey Shore and its towns, um, they were still open for business. Um, so you can see from there I transitioned because when I was there we, we worked with about six or seven different companies at the time to break Guinness World Records titles that I moved on sort of in-house, so to speak, to Guinness World Records. And for three years when I was there, it was very exciting. Was, we were working with brands and agencies and nonprofits and universities on record breaking. And on the left here is just this fun cutout we had in our office um, with uh, Robert Wadlow, who is the world's tallest man at 8 foot 11 inches. If you can believe that. I'm 5'8 on a good day kind of thing. Um, but 8 foot 11, pretty, pretty incredible. Um, so I oversaw our, our commercial sales efforts and our B2B marketing, again, working with companies of all types and sizes. I would go out and speak um, at conferences like this and others across the country uh, about the power of record breaking and how it could tell a PR story for a brand or organization of any type. About four years ago, through personal experience, I founded the Autism MVP Foundation, which is a nonprofit, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, dedicated to improving the number and the quality of autism-focused uh, uh, educators and therapists. Um, it's based on personal experience. My son is on the autism spectrum. Uh, he'll be 13, and can't believe I'm saying that, in, uh, in October. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Uh, I've also taught, uh, feel very fortunate to have shared my experiences um, with students at four different universities, and I still guest lecture at some universities as well, um, but taught at VCU, Virginia State, um, Utah Valley University, and University of, of Phoenix. Um, one of my current projects right now, in addition to um, doing some consulting work, is I'm writing a book. This is a first for me, so I'm excited about this. Um, and it's uh, centered around the little extras that nonprofits do to attract and retain their best employees, volunteers, donors, and board members. So I'm teaming up with one of my former Synergy colleagues, Stan Phelps, in this book. And um, through the work that I've, uh, I've been conducting through the Autism MVP Foundation, it was a natural conduit to write this book. So I'm excited about that. Um, very proud graduate, uh, two-time graduate of Temple University in Philadelphia, undergraduate for journalism, um, sports administration for my master's degree, and I currently live in New Jersey, um, along the New Jersey, New Jersey shore, about 10 minutes from the ocean, with uh, my wife Donna and our son Gavin, and that is our dog, Brew. So uh, that's a little bit about me and my background. <coughs> I want to tell you a little bit about what inspired me and where my love for storytelling comes from. Um, this is my father. We lost him, unfortunately, nine years ago. Um, but he, here he is in the middle with um, uh, my son, Gavin. And then that's him on a hunting trip way back in the mid-70s. Um, but you know, family um, is, is a big inspiration in terms of storytelling. And I think you can find that um, in a lot of cases. And we talked about this, Becky, last night, right? You told one of the most fantastic stories I've heard in a while. You're lucky I don't call you up here to, bring, to tell that story. Um, my father was a master storyteller, even though it had nothing to do with his upbringing. Uh, great sense of humor, a quick wit, um, and just a terrific sense of timing. I think all things that were very instrumental in telling good stories. Um, and I want to share a story with you that he told me about, uh, about him growing up that left an impression with me and made me think about storytelling over the years. Now, who here had, had pets as a kid? Wow, about 80% of you. Anybody not allowed to have pets? 
surprising. All right, we got a few in here. Okay. All right, so I have a story for all of you, the three of you in particular. Okay. So we were not allowed to have pets when we were kids. And it didn't really bother me that much because I didn't really have close friends that had pets. We had a next door neighbor that had a really annoying dog, so I didn't think I was really missing much. And about the mid 80s when I was growing up, the, the hermit crab craze hit, right? So you had, everybody had to have a hermit crab, right? Anybody remember this? Anybody? She's laughing, she remembers this, right? So everybody had to have a hermit crab. So I never really pressed my dad much on why we, why we couldn't have pets. And, but the hermit crab got me thinking. I'm like, come on, let's, let's, let's have, why don't we have a dog? He's like, and his argument was always, they smell, they make noise, you're gonna have to take care of it, I know you don't want to, even though you want the pet, the whole thing. I said, all right, well, I don't, what's, you know, I don't understand. If you've never had a pet before, Dad, then why, what's your, what's your big whole thing against it? And he said, so I had a pet once. I said, what are you talking about, you had a pet once? I said, okay, would you have a dog? No, I had a pet duck. He had a pet duck. Who's a pet duck? So, and my dad had a pretty tough upbringing. Um, his parents weren't around a whole lot. And, you know, he did his best. He had an extended family to help look after him. And so he adored this pet duck he had for a few years. And he's outside playing with his friends one day. He gets home around dinner time and sort of gets in right as dinner is going to be ready. He sits down at the table, kind of pokes his head around for the duck, can't find Charlie. And um, so he's halfway through the dinner, and uh, he says to his parents, like, hey, where's, where's Charlie the duck? And his mom says, you're eating him. Oh. Right. Horrible story, right? Now, obviously, that scarred my dad and left an impression on me. It didn't scar me in that way. But it, it, it made an impression on me in terms of different ways to tell stories. He could have just told me, clean and been done with it. No, we're not going to have pets. Um, but what he, what he was trying to tell me is that it would have brought, bad, brought back bad memories for him for having pets. So that left an impression on me in a number of different ways. Um, through his love of music, that also very much inspired me. Um, if you think about um, listening to music these days, it's very different th from when I was growing up in the late 70s and the mid 80s, okay? And you were lucky if you bought a vinyl album and the words to the songs were on there. It just was not something that normally happened, right? Anybody else remember this, right? So you didn't know what the songs meant. Um, you, you're lucky if you could understand them, to be honest with you, right? Um, so that was in, just an interesting aspect of trying to figure out on your own, what did these stories, what did these songs mean? And over the course of time, I started to listen very closely, I started to ask questions, and it just very much fueled my imagination for what good storytelling could be like. And in fact, one of my dad's favorite artists was Rod Stewart. He later came out with this anthology called Storyteller, and it just made perfect sense to me. You're telling stories to the power of music. And I'm gonna talk about this later, about an area you can go back to if you ever need and you're stuck for inspirational ideas. Um, one of my favorite songs when I was growing up was this song by Dire Straits um, called Sultan's a Swing. And I just liked the way the music sounded. It was a great song. And I found out later on that this song was actually um, based on real life experiences, but it was actually a fictional portrayal of something that happened to Mark Knopfler, the, Mark Knopfler, the lead singer of Dire Straits. He walked into a pub one night in a deserted pub one night in London, and he's listening to this band that uh, is terrible. They're absolutely awful. And there's like four groups of people inside the pub, and none of them are paying attention to the band. And the band gets done at the end of their set, and the guy stands up, and he says, thank you very much. We are the Sultans of Swing. And this made an impression on him, and he built this story, this fictional story around who these band members were in their lives. Um, and the irony of them saying they're the Sultans of Swing when they were absolutely horrible, and nobody was paying attention to them. So, Music is a great way and proved to be a great inspiration for me. Same thing with reading, okay? When I was growing up, we would get the evening newspaper delivered to my house. My dad would pour over it every night when he got home from work. Baseball games and football games, you weren't getting every game on TV. Cable was inaccessible at that point in time. So you had to read and imagine what was going on, okay, in a game that you probably didn't see. You had to pour over the box score to understand the numbers and understand the data of what happened in the game, even if it wasn't very sophisticated at the time. So this very much forced myself, this forced me to imagine things a little bit differently, I think helped with the creative side of storytelling. So this is what I tell people when 
they get stuck on how to tell a story. And it's the best you can return to the very basic facts of information gathering. Does anybody want to take a crack at what sort of the basic areas of information gathering are, the five W's? Yes, exactly. Who, what, where, when, and why. Now, followed by this are, the, are sort of the traditional H, right, which is how. And I'm also going to talk about how many. And a lot of these are not as obvious as they think. Some are, but some aren't. But we'll give you different ways, again, if you get stuck and are in need, are in need of creative ways to bring your story to life. <coughs> OK. The first one we'll start is who, and emphasizing and remembering who is your end game audience that you want to convey your story to, or who are your customers? What exactly are they saying? Oops, that didn't work. That's OK. OK, where, where in the story, this is supposed to be a, my gifts aren't working. Um, that's OK. Um, where in the story, not physically, where does the story happen, but where's the tipping point? Where's the emotional hook within your story? And do you start your story there and work backwards? Or do you start at the beginning, work your way up, and then work your way down? So it's not about physical location of the story. Again, it's about um, where in that, where, what point or where in the story should you begin. Um, when, when's the pivotal moment, OK, in a brand story history? That's what I want to talk about at some point, when. I think people often overlook the nostalgia factor, the history factor, uh, history factor of a company. And you can go back and get some great stories by looking at what a brand story is all about, looking at it from the beginning. And then why? These are probably the most self-explanatory. Why? Why did you make this new product? Why are we here? And then how? How in the world did you do that? We'll talk about this a little bit later, right? How did this car end up there? Who knows, right? Um, and then how, back to how many, how to use your data in your storytelling, and how can you make data come to life, make your story come to life through the power of numbers? Oh, it's working. There we go. OK, I want to talk a little, bit about, a little bit about who. So regardless if you're a product or service-based organization, you can find great nuggets from your customer service or customer experience teams. This is one of the uh, tactics that I use quite frequently when I was at Richmond Raceway. And I would get very PRable moments from talking to our, our ticket people. And this goes back to my role in the ticket office at the 76ers. I would talk to people and learn about their, their needs, their desires, their wants. And I employed that later on as the PR director by going into our ticket director and saying, what are the customers saying to you and your team members? Tell me about, your, you know, tell me, tell me about what they're saying. Um, one of the things that I did later at Guinness World Records was survey our clients. And it wasn't a survey monkey. It was picking up the phone, finding out how they felt about working with us. And I would start every survey with one simple question. Tell me about your experience working with us. And it was a purposely open-ended question and allowed them just to tell their own stories in their own words. And it was very, very effective. So talk to the people who talk to your customers. A couple examples of this. When I was working at the racetrack in Richmond, our ticket director, Diane, says, she's like, you know, there's this guy that comes into our office. He comes in every year, and he comes in with a coffee can. And he sits the coffee can down on the ticket counter. He opens it up, and he counts out his money for his tickets for the May and September races, and he leaves. And that's, he, he saves up all year, puts that can underneath his bed, brings it back out when it's time to pay for his tickets, drives two hours from North Carolina to pay for his tickets, and he leaves. And there was another story about a guy who told our ticket people that he takes all of his family money. They don't go to the Bellagio in Vegas. They don't go to the Bahamas. But they come to Richmond. They come to the track and splurge all the, the, the biggest meals, the best hotels, the best tickets at the race. So all of a sudden, I have these PRable moments from our customers because I'm talking to the people who talk to them. It's a very effective tool um, that, again, uh, I used over and over again, and, and, and uh, just a treasure trove of stories. Anybody know who this is? 
Danica Patrick, right. Um, so here's, it's, it's also important to look for what people say and what's that maybe one key phrase that can turn into an entire story for you. So when I was at, at the track in Richmond, um, Danica Patrick finished fourth in, in the Indy 500 one year. I'm sure many of you remember this. And it was going to be her first trip to the racetrack and our race was scheduled for the end of June, about a month after this Indy 500 historical, historical race, even though she didn't win. And so I went to our, our ticket director and I said, can you tell me what, what's the buzz about? Now we're selling tickets at a pretty good clip. What are fans saying? Are NASCAR fans buying the tickets? Is it just, you know, what's going on here? And it was very much a, Richmond, very much a non-traditional IndyCar market, very much a NASCAR market. Um, so as this series was just trying to build momentum at this track, we were hoping that over time it was going to keep escalating in terms of ticket sales. And now with this, you know, huge finish by her, she's on the cover of Sports Illustrated, we're getting more inquiries. And I said to our ticket director, I said, Diane, I said, what, what's going on out there? And she said, well, she's like, this one guy came in to renew his tickets for September. And he's just about to leave. And there's a poster up there on the counter for the race. And it's got Danica's picture on it. And he says, let me have a ticket to this Danica thing. OK? And that was a, a very sort of pivotal moment, I think, for, for me. And it helped me realize that she was transcending not just racing but just pop culture in general this guy didn't know anything about the sport or indie cards like he didn't know anything about indie cards very apparent but he wanted to be part of something bigger and he said give me a ticket to this danica thing and about a week before the race i um was called by espn and they were doing a an outside the lines magazine show on danica and her impact on the sport and pop culture and i told them this story and they said wait we need to can we, you need to back up, you need to tell the story again. So I told them the whole story about, I want a ticket to this Danica thing. Well, not only did they use that in the Outside the Line show, but they used it as the lead-in tease on SportsCenter to the show. So again, it's going back to understanding who your customers are, what they're saying, and try to extract that information so you, in turn, can tell stories. Again, going back to what people say. Um, I was on a family trip last summer, and this, I guess, anecdote you could say was, came from something that just happened to me on one of our family riverboat cruises one night. And I'm having a conversation with the guy who's running the cruise. It's just my family and one other family on this little boat. And this guy said something very interesting to me. We're, we're having a chat about the business of riverboat cruises and what else he does for a living and how long he's been there. Just this super nice, salt of the earth guy. And he says, well, he says, I get up at 3 a.m. every day, and I go to a golf course. And I get the course ready. I mow the grass. And I'm looking at my watch. It's like 7.30 at night, right? And I said, wow, that, that's, a, that's a long day. And he looks at me. He goes, there ain't nothing long about this day at all. And so that made just a huge impression on me in terms of hearing something that somebody says and being able to turn it into a larger narrative, which I did about appreciating things at work. And when you sit back and you go on vacation and different things you can learn about the office and the office environment and your career by being on vacation. Now, I, I did not go into my vacation. In fact, if you read the blog post, it's the last thing I was thinking about was work. But it, just, it was interesting to hear this guy say one thing and it just spurred an idea for me that, hey, do what you love and it's gonna, it's gonna help really fuel and advance your career. So it's just a great story. Um, where, I want to talk about, um, again, where, where is the, um, the tipping point? Again, not where does your story take place. Here's your traditional storytelling arc. Okay, you start with the introduction. You have the rising action and conflict. Um, you have the climax here, or the pinnacle, um, and the falling action and the resolution. Okay, now it's important. Um, to find that best place. And the best place to tell your story or start your story may not always be at the climax or at the beginning. So you have to figure out where that might be based on what is happening. And I'm going to give you an example of that here um, in a second. So I told you a little bit about the Autism MVP Foundation. And when I founded this organization um, four years ago, and I need to make this a little bigger so I can read it. Um, it, was very, it could have been very easy for me to share with people that, well, I shared this because my son was diagnosed. 
Uh, at a very young age, we had a lot of help from some amazing people who really we feel are helping him reach his maximum potential. Um, but what I wanted to do instead was really bring to the reader the pivotal moment in time when he was diagnosed, okay? And I'll read this to you very quickly. The neurologist conducted a second round of field tests on our son then excused herself from her office for a few minutes. After what seemed like an eternity, she re-entered the room and closed the door. It was our second visit that year. There generally isn't a diagnosis made on the first visit. And my wife and I braced ourselves for what we knew deep down was coming. Still, the words, one phrase in particular, actually hung in the air like a bad curveball from a washed up pitcher. I don't recall the sentence verbatim, just that her words were consistent with autism. Now, I chose to, at that point in time, bring the reader in by, by sharing a very raw emotional moment and what the turning point was for the story and finding uh, and founding the organization. And then I built the story backwards. If you read the story, I built it backwards from there. How did I get introduced to autism? I didn't, know what, I didn't know what autism was three years before my son was born. I got introduced to it through the racing field. And then how did I learn more about it? And then our son was diagnosed. And then the following action is, well, what have you been doing since to help him? What are you doing since to help the, since to help the community? And what are you now, what's the resolution? What are you doing moving forward, right, to, to help the autism community? So finding that, that point and hooking the reader in, and these don't always have to be at the same place along the story arc. Um, when? Um, I think, it, I mentioned before, an often overlooked aspect of storytelling is who here works directly for a brand? A couple people, a couple of you. Finding out about your brand's history. Okay, we are all, we're all suckers for nostalgia. And I don't think enough companies leverage this and utilize it and find out enough about their own history and tell their stories about it. Um, I spoke at um, this, this event last year called the uh, Anniversary Marketing Summit where several brands came together just to talk about their 25th or 50th or 150th anniversaries and how they leveraged the, the stories behind the founding of their organizations, how they grew from nothing. And when you need to get your brand out in the marketplace, this is a huge opportunity to take advantage of it. doesn't matter if it's a fifth anniversary or a 10th or 15th. Um, how did the company start? How did it grow? Um, when I was at Guinness World Records, there's always a, there's a fascinating story behind, behind that. And people always ask, is this Guinness beer? Are you part of Guinness beer? And in fact, the answer is, is yes. We were actually part of um, Guinness Brewery. We were founded by people who, who ran the Guinness Brewery. And the story is, one day the managing director for Guinness Brewery is out on a game bird hunting trip with one of his colleagues. And they're on a private estate, they're shooting birds, and one guy, one of the two uh, gentlemen, takes a shot at one of the birds, and he completely misses, and he turns to the other guy and he says, that has to be the fastest game bird in the world, I have no idea how I missed. And so they get in this sort of friendly disagreement about uh, what's the fastest game bird in the world. So they go back to the estate where they're staying later that night, and for, from there on they look, they do some research, and they figure out there's no book out there that settles these um, you know, arguments, so to speak, of the world superlative. So um, fast forward a couple years later, they hire the McGurder twins, pictured here, to write the first Guinness Book of World Records, the world's tallest man, uh, world's fastest woman, whatever it is. Um, and the way they actually marketed the book was pure genius. Who read that book as a kid? Really? Not more than that? Wow, OK. Explains why book sales were slow, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> they, they actually marketed the book. At, at the time, um, Guinness Beer not only owned, of course, the beer, but they owned many pubs around the UK. So they took the book, this is back in the mid-50s, they took the book and put it in a beer slash waterproof sleeve and gave it to the pub owners and told them to put it behind the bar as a way to settle pub disagreement, disagreements. So that's how it started. And years later, it, right, it's great. So years later, this morphed into um, a child's book, a children's book that 7 to 11-year-olds um, enjoy and love and read. It's this coffee table book now. Um, if you ever actually get a hold of the first book, it's very extremely inappropriate, some of the things that are in there. But um, it's just interesting how, how these things evolve over time. <coughs> 
excuse me. Okay. Okay. Um, actually, this is gonna, this is a weird story, kind, sort of going back full circle to to Mark Knopfler um, at uh, at Dire Straits. So when I was the uh, PR director at the track in Richmond, um, I found out one day that Mark Knopfler's coming out with this new album, and on that album is is a track called Speedway at Nazareth, and I said. You have to be kidding. Is this the same track? The track that I, I work at in a small track nobody knows about? And long story short, um, I chased down his publicist. The, this is, the internet was not very sophisticated th those days. So I, had to, I managed to chase down this guy who was his publicist. And I explained to him who I was and um, would he be willing to come visit the racetrack or talk about you know, why he wrote this song. And the answer was no. So like any good PR person, I was very persistent. I came back to him about a week later, and I said, look, I know I just saw this, the tour schedule came out. You're going to be in Philadelphia. It's you know, not even an hour from the track. Would he be willing to come up? So he goes, all right, let me, let me think. I'll, I'll ask him. I'll get back to you. So he calls me back, and he says, he'll come and visit the track, but no media. I said, that's cool. I said, I just, well, we just want to talk to him. We want to find out why he wrote this song, because nobody else is going to tell the story. It was up to us as a racetrack to tell the story. So why in the world did he write this song? So he came up and visited with us. Here I am on top of the media center with him. He actually signed the liner notes for the song later on when we saw him. Um, and, he, and he shared that he wrote that story because he was, um, was influenced by a friend of his who was a Formula One driver who raced at the track um, in some other racing series. And he always talked about how difficult it was, but it was fun and tricky, and he loved it. So we needed to find out what, you know, what the why was, and he, and he gave it to us. So it was pretty cool. All right, let's hopefully this media will work here. Um, going back to the how, this is the, um, the Guinness World Records event that I did when I was at Synergy, where we built the world's tallest pinata. Hopefully this video is going to work here. Let's see. Nope, hold on. There we go. I can't hear you anymore! Let's see how big this is. You can see how big this is. Ready? Man. Five, four, three, two, one! So the story there was, how did you build that thing, right? Now, that wasn't our client's story. Our client was Weber Shanwick, and their job is to push the story out about the, can, or, you know, the candy, right? But our story, from our perspective, was at Synergy, how did you guys build a 46-foot tall pinata? What was the engineering that went into it? How long did it take you to build it? Um, this took place in the um, armory at 23rd in Lexington, New York City crazy high ceilings. Um, so that was a story we had to tell. And then we turned that into, um, parlayed that into actually a little bit of a story in New York Times. So it was pretty cool. So how did you build that? It's not the main story, but it was a story that was important to us. So always keep that, that in mind as well. And I'm going to share with you one more. Um, this is one of my favorite case studies from, from when I was at Guinness World Records. And hopefully this will work as well. Um, but this is about um, the launch of uh, a washing machine. And this highlights how technology, um, through this little stunt, um, makes this product stand out and make, makes it different. Building a huge house of cards is something that requires a lifetime of practice and lots of skill. Controlled environment. So when LG asked me if I could build a huge house of cards on top of an operating Centum system, I really thought that that sounded like a crazy idea. In fact, I thought it would be impossible.
15 minutes exactly now. Five, four, three, two, one, stop building. Pretty cool, right? So how do you highlight technology by building a house the of The thing cars? that people want to see the most is the implosion. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. Um, he did that just to make sure people understood that it wasn't taped or glued together, right? Um, but how do you highlight a technology um, for a washing machine that doesn't vibrate? You build a house of cards on top of it. Just one of my favorite stories uh, and records from, from when I was at the company. Um, I talked before a little bit about data and leveraging it. And I'll go back to the Autism MVP Foundation and um, tell you a story about data and what it means to not only this organization, but what it means to um, the autism community in general. And when I was growing up, again, I'm dating myself, I continue to do that, but in the 70s and 80s, the autism diagnosis rate in the United States was one in 10,000. When my son was born, it was one in 88. Last year, the CDC came out and they shared that the autism diagnosis rate in the United States is 1 in 59. Now, what exactly does that mean? That starts to tell a story, okay, that there's a problem. But what does it really mean? So when you compare 1 in 59 against the birth rate in the United States, that means 60,000 kids a year in the U.S. are diagnosed with autism. Where I live in New Jersey, the autism diagnosis rate is 1 in 34, which is the highest in the country. That means 3,000 kids every year in New Jersey are diagnosed with autism. So suddenly, there's a powerful story to be told around data. So it's not just that personal journey that I shared, but it tells you that there's a real math problem. Okay? And... In their simplest forms, this is a good way to share with people and really open their eyes that there are issues and that there aren't enough special education teachers. There aren't enough teachers to begin with. There's a teacher shortage. But there aren't enough special education teachers. There aren't enough therapists in the areas of OT and speech, um, physical therapy, applied behavior analysis, um, to be out there in the marketplace to help students. So again, leveraging data. So and then different ways to show that data within the confines of your story for something like this. So you're gonna share one in 59? Are you gonna share one in 59? That's maybe a little more personal. Or are you gonna share one in 59? So within the confines of your storytelling, you can use data to tell it in different ways. So again, going back to kickstarting your storytelling, who, what, where, when, why, how, and how many. And this is what I like to tell people. I, I, I talked about some of this at the beginning. Um, Kickstart your storytelling with listening to music and lyrics and reading it. Go listen to music you don't normally listen to. Pick a completely new genre, okay? You have to remember that the creative side of your brain is a muscle. And the more you use it, the better you'll get. This will help your storytelling. So go find different ways to kickstart your brain. Read fiction. Okay, especially Game of Thrones fans here, right? Um, read it, watch it, whatever it is. Write things down. Take a tablet out and write things down. Don't even type it in the computer. Write it down. Write a story down. Write your story down that you told me last night, right? Make it come to life. Ask a friend or a family member to tell you a story that you've never heard before and listen to the way they tell it and how they tell it and see if you can keep in mind some of these tips I share with you to maybe help them tell that story better. Now, if you need a complete reset of your mind, your creative side, meditate, okay? I started doing this a couple years ago. I use it, I don't, I'm not a crazy Zen guy about it, but um, I use Simple Habit, which is a very useful meditation app. There's plenty of them out there. I'm not, this is not a commercial for Simple Habit. Um, but I use it, I enjoy it. 
I actually do it every every night um, when I put my son to bed. My wife and I switch off every night. He loves it. He loves to do the meditation. Um, but again, if you just go into a quiet space in your office, you need to figure out different ways to you know kickstart your creativity. Clear it out and meditate. Um, so those are my tips. Do you have any questions? Can we get the lights back on. Any questions at all? Yes, go ahead. Oh, hi. So we do a lot of numbers. Okay, cool. <laughs> and um, what we have found is when it comes to statistics, mm -hmm. what an organization might think is the statistic that is most important, oftentimes it's not the statistic that resonates with the audience okay. that you are specific to target market. Okay. So um, we, we put a lot into the challenge. Sure. How to translate that. But are you noticing changes with the way that numbers are resonating over time and with demographics? Because what we're starting to see, those one in a thousand mm -hmm. is really scary yeah. for younger demographics. They feel like they can't make an impact in the okay. one in a thousand. Sure. There you go. Yeah. That, you know, how can I donate blood right. when every two seconds, you know, what impact am I going to make? Right. So how do you um, pick those statistics and those times in order to have that maximum impact? Sure. Without the business needs as well. Right, right. So I'll, I'll repeat the question for the benefit of, of everybody up there. So you can stop me if I don't summarize this correctly. But how do you find the best data to tell your story in a nutshell, is that right? Sometimes certain things resonate with certain folks and other times things do, is that, is that fair? Yeah, yeah I, I think what I've found is that I keep telling the stories over and over and different, at different, and different data points until I hit one that really resonates with people. Um, the two seconds one, did that resonate with folks or, or did it not? No. So it's me right. going out there, kind of dropping the bucket. Right, right. Yeah, it's not gonna, I'm not going to make an impact. It's, like, it's almost like a futile effort. Well, I mean, I think the interesting thing there is that while that's a, I think we would all agree that's a very powerful statistic, it doesn't mean that you have to necessarily use that data in your publicity efforts. Now, you might, maybe you have some people running some interference there with you in terms of, well, we have to get that message out. Um, but I think... You know, analytics is so important, such an important part of what all of us do these days, whether we realize it or not, whether it's website traffic or, or stats like this. Um, have you ever done any any surveys with any of your That's your groups? What finally okay. Spoke to okay. Was when we were able to put it together in a right. slide deck with the research behind it. Okay. Said, here's what they're saying is not helpful, and here's right. what. So was the dialogue switching it complete, completely off of data or just some of the data points? Switching the data points. Switching the data points. The statistic that resonated better. Got it. So, um, you know, you can take up to three lives with a single There you go. There you go. That is an impact that a right. feels like they can make rather than every two seconds somebody needs blood. Right. So things like that, changing that verbiage. Okay. Got it. So, so for the I'll get to you next. So, for the benefit of of, of people listening, um, so the dialogue was slightly changed based on some surveys that your organization, the Red Cross, did. Um, so, all of a sudden, a different data point was more at the front of a of a publicity effort or a marketing effort, as opposed to something different. So, look for different data points that might resonate with your target audience. Right. It's great. It's a great question. Good. Good story. Thanks. Yes. I was just going to make an observation that I think that's common with nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Right. Rather than look at the scary problem that's huge. Right. I mean, you need maybe need that too, but, sure. but people are more inclined to act if they can see what they can do. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's interesting. I feel like in some cases, what ends up getting picked up by the media and what the media wants to hear is that scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What the the donor and the um, the wants to hear is the opposite. 
Right. Well, and you might need different things for different Correct. purposes, different channels, sure. different goals. Different so target audiences, yeah. right. Right. So the, so the point there, if you didn't hear for the rest of the group, was that, and there's a great point, is that sometimes what you feel is a great media message with a data point is not necessarily what your, maybe your donor target wants to hear, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Maybe those, you have to reconcile that maybe those two are, are not quite the, quite the same and you have to sort of market to one group, the press, as, as you do differently to a, to a donor base or somebody you're trying to retain. Yes, Cynthia, hi. Hi, I want to make an unabashed plug for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was enjoyable. We talked about um, it was part of that story about the foundation and um, how it got started, and my, my inspiration originally from one of the uh, NASCAR drivers who um, uh, who had uh, who has a daughter who's on the autism spectrum, and how I got to know him long before I even had had a need. Um, so that was that was great. We talked about data as well um, and how important that is. So so thank you. I enjoyed that. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to tell the story of, you know, the length of your organization in the past, sure. how do you leverage that for um, newer audiences or people who maybe don't have a nostalgic connection to the organization or the, that history? Right. So the question is, um, how can you take some of the past things that happened at your company, some of the nostalgia, uh, and relate it to... Uh, a group that might not be familiar with your, your brand in the first place. Is that right? Now, who do, who do you work for, if you don't mind me asking? No, I work for the Texas, Texas Association of School Boards. OK. Um, and specifically, the service area that I work with is the Task and Risk Management Fund. OK. We sell insurance to school districts. Got it. And we're celebrating our 45th year this year. Ah. Um, so, yeah. OK. Got it. So, you'd, so you're taught, it's a B2B play, yes, essentially. Yes. OK. So you may, so you want to tap into that target audience, those groups that, that want to buy from you, right? Yeah. OK. Um, so how do you relate to them if they're not familiar with your history, right? Um, are you planning on doing anything, first of all, if you don't mind me asking, like around your, your anniversary? Yeah, or? I mean, it's kind, of, it's kind of late for this year. We've done a little bit already this year. Sure. But 45 is really not like, yeah. the deal. So right. I'm thinking more about the 50. 50th. Yeah, sure. Exactly. Sure. So we, we do have um, a Texas Association of School Boards yeah. event coming up in January, which is like the month that we were celebrating. Right. Um, and we've um, you know done a little bit of content marketing blogs, sure. magazine articles, that type of thing. Okay. Um, talking a, a lot about just the, the length, of, you know, the longevity of us and, and the strength. Yeah. But um, I'm not sure how much that resonates with people who are currently working in school districts who weren't working in school districts 45 years sure. ago. Sure. You know, like, do they even care? Right. <laughs> I would well, I would think in that industry people would. I would think the fact that you've been around for that long is something that you can and you should leverage. Um, it's it's a different and interesting space for sure. So the fact that you could point to credibility, um, I think is is more than interesting. Um, if you have success stories along the way from clients that you can share, maybe don't even go to the history of who it was that founded it. Um, unless it's a super compelling story, and it might be. Right. But maybe you point out, yeah, but I like putting together when you go through a brand's history of a timeline and what were some of the key moments along the way when you hit customer number X or um, how you grew at this point in, in time you know, at the company, and all of a sudden you went from X client to X clients, whatever. Now you have 1,000 clients, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but I think, that, I think that's the, the 50th thing to me speaks a lot to yeah the organization's credibility, especially in a space like that. Um, so it's interesting. Yeah, sure, sure. Any other questions? OK. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.